I personally think we're living in a corrupt country and Rishi Sunak and the people around him are facilitating that corruption. It stinks. This country doesn't work and it's starting to give off a whiff of corruption everywhere you look and that's a shame. So we need a change as soon as we can get it. Well, the companies today at the behest of the government have announced uh, all of the ticket offices in Britain will be closed. Uh, there may be a bit of phasing, but they're all targeted for closure and many of them almost immediately. So they've launched a public consultation on that and we're going to respond to that and try and mobilise our members and the public, disabled groups, women's groups, the blind and the deaf groups, all sorts of people who've got accessibility and security issues, but it's not really about ticket offices, it's about de-staffing the stations. So the only thing that keeps railway staff on a station are the regulations about ticket offices. Once they've removed those, they can remove all station staff from any location and we'll end up with a completely insecure, inaccessible railway. And they've made some vague promises and commitments about that, but they won't be regulated. And as soon as a company, as particularly a profit-seeking company, doesn't have to abide by regulations or statute, they won't. And so we're faced with a massive attack on our people. We think thousands of jobs are going to go. We've already been served with statutory redundancy notices at at least four or five of the companies. We're expecting more of those today across all 14 companies. So we've got the fight of our life for our members' jobs, but also for the service that the public uh, should be getting from their railway service. Can you talk to me a little bit about that service? So, I mean, say there's someone out there who thinks that they don't use their ticket office. I mean, why, why are they useful? Well, the ticket office is a beacon of safety. That you can guarantee that, hopefully, that there's a member of staff in there, and it's those regulations that keep them there. So this Schedule 21 um, consultation, which sounds technical, is about the removal of any human presence on many stations, particularly those where uh, the, the outlying stations, the ones that are not covered by the, the main towns in our, and cities in our, in our country. So women and the disabled, people that feel vulnerable and insecure, will find that there's nobody working at those stations in the future. And of course the people that will find that out as well are the people that want to do antisocial behaviour, want to get drunk, want to do drug deals and all sorts of stuff. That's what our stations will become because there'll be nobody there to control those stations, control the access to them. And if you've got a disability, need assistance getting on board or need assistance buying a ticket or just understanding the system, there will very likely to be nobody there at all to assist you, which we've had in the past. We had that after privatisation and recovered that position through proper staffing, but now that's all up for grabs. And all through this, the companies will continue to roll in profits as they have done during COVID and as they have done during the pandemic uh, and during our strike action. And who stands to benefit from this then? I mean, is it the Department for Transport? Is it train companies? Both. The Department for Transport will cut their subsidy and the train operating companies will increase their profits. If there's less staff, they won't have to pay their wages, won't have to pay their national insurance and pensions. So they stand to make money from this. And it's also a message about the way public services are run in this country. The government wants to de-staff public services entirely, whether it's in your schools, care homes, hospitals or whatever you want to look at, council services, are all under threat through budget cuts. And they're trying to teach everybody a lesson that you can run a de-staffed, dehumanised system where every person has to fend for themselves, basically. And if you want to battle your way to work or out to a social function, you'll have to do that without the assistance of staff to protect you and to guide you about how to use the system. The department and other um, actors around the department have said that, well, this is how it always was. You know, we had driver-only operations and we didn't have staff at ticket offices and everything worked fine. I mean, what's changed in the last 20, 30 years? Well, we used to have a fully staffed and fully funded railway. We used to have people there to assist you with your baggage, people there to assist you with your mobility. There is that there now in a lot of places, but it has been de-staffed to a certain extent. They're going to go for that wholesale now. And people will find it's, it could be hostile territory for them and their families. If you're worried about your partner coming home late from work or late from a function, you should be worried because there may not be anyone there to assist them. There may not be anyone there who they can contact. What they will say is you can have an app, and if you can use an app, that might help you. Or you can ring a call centre to get assistance. But if you are in distress, if you're taken ill, if you've had an accident, if you've tripped over, or if you're under pressure from hostile... Um, other members of the public, drunken passengers or whatever, 
An app isn't going to assist you. It's not going to get you to a place of safety. And it may not, you may not get any response whatsoever. People are used to this. They're used to the poor service they get. But what we're going towards is a low-cost, all-profit railway system, like you get from the low-cost airlines, where, where many people consider them to be hostile environments. But there are no regulations after these ticket offices are shut to guarantee that anyone will be there to help anyone of any category or any user type. What do you say to the argument that perhaps the strikes have led to this? I mean, it's certainly one that's being purported by a few tabloids. Well, the strikes have stopped this. They, they wanted to do this uh, as soon as COVID came upon us. They said, you'll have to change. The strikes have put this off for over a year. They haven't felt strong enough uh, to take us on on this issue. They haven't felt able to implement the changes. But they're now under pressure from the government who want a distraction, who want to paint the RMT as some kind of bad actor in this. We think we are the people that are defending the service. We think we're the people that are defending the public from a de-staffed, dehumanised railway. So we'll keep going and we've got a duty to defend our members and their jobs. We haven't had a pay rise for four years. If you lose your job as a result of these redundancies, you won't get a pay rise at all. So we're here to defend the service, defend the public, but also to preserve our members' jobs and to get them uh, the decent conditions and a pay rise. And we'll keep doing that. That's our responsibility as a trade union. Why would the government want to shut ticket offices if they're so beneficial? Well, they want to save money. They want to save money across the piece. They want this world to become an automated, uh, dehumanised society, I think. That's the way society's gone. People don't have bank branches. They don't have services on their high street. We've seen the state of the high streets and how antisocial some of our town centres can be when retail goes, when uh, services go and everything's done online. Many people can't use online. Many of our elderly population can't use online services. They don't know what an app is. We're seeing that about the way you access parking and public services from your council. People don't like it. They want uh, an enjoyable experience on the railway where there's friendly faces who know what they're doing, are professional in what they do. And we're also going to lose safety critical work out of this. We're going to lose train dispatchers, and other safety critical workers on the stations so that they can automate the whole system and make more money. I want to ask you about Rishi Sunak. So this week is the first of two weeks that he will miss Prime Minister's questions. He also missed one last month. Mm. You have had many insults levied at yourselves mm. or your union for skipping work. I mean, would you say it's about the same? Well, our members don't skip work. They pick it their workplaces and they're, they're uh, pursuing a campaign and they've made a lot of sacrifices for that. In terms of the RMT, we always turn up for the media. We're always there taking any questions, whether they're hostile or neutral. So we always show up. Unfortunately, the politicians who are making these decisions think that they can slip away, go back to their comfort of their uh, very plush housing, uh, back to the comfort of their billionaire lifestyles, as many of them have, and not face the public and not even face the scrutiny of the dispatch box. I think that's a disgrace. That's, uh, Systems meant to be built on accountability and democracy. But there's none of that in this country. We've got the oligarchs in charge. We've got people who are making fortunes from public services, including the railway, uh, private contractors and so forth, including the train operating companies. And Sunak and Hunt are prepared to see that uh, transfer of wealth from the public services in the NHS, in schools, in our councils, and now on the railway. That's the system that they want where people can have their palms greased as long as they support the Conservative Party. I personally think we're living in a corrupt country, and Rishi Sunak and the people around him are facilitating that corruption. It stinks. This country doesn't work, and it's starting to give off a whiff of corruption everywhere you look, and that's a shame, so we need a change as soon as we can get it. Do you think it's possible that Rishi Sunak hasn't had to use a train ticket office? I doubt if he's had to come off a, a, a late shift working at a hospital or in a factory at half past 11 at night and then navigate his way through the public transport system uh, faced with people who are coming out of pubs and coming out of all sorts of situations, uh, seeing all the homeless people in our society, seeing all the people that are using food banks. He doesn't live in the world that the rest of us live in. And he, worse than that, he doesn't care about the world that the rest of us live in. He just wants to get on with lining his own pocket more than it's already lined and making sure that his friends benefit from the system that he presides over. Mick Lynch, thank you very much.